All right. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, good morning, um, good afternoon, and good evening, based on where you are located. And welcome to this webinar organized by the NIO Center for Data Reading and Sensor Technologies. The title of the webinar is Transforming Health and Safety Sensor Data into Information and Action. And specifically for this year, the focus is going to be heat stress and strain. My name is Emanuele Cauda. Uh, I'm at NIOSH and I am the director of the Center for Data Reading and Sensor Technologies. And I'm here today with um, Emily Haas. Uh, she's the assistant coordinator for the center. And the two of us have been um, received a lot of help uh, organizing this webinar by Valerie Lambros and Salman uh, al -Kwawi. And I would like to thank both of them um, for this organization. Um, so for who of you doesn't know, um, the NIO Center for Direct Reading and Sensor Technologies. Um, I thought just to have one slide of intro. Um, you see also the QR code. If you wanna take a look at, the, at our website, that will definitely require a little bit of like uh, restyling and we hope to do it in the next few months. We are now at the 10 year celebration of the center that was established 10 years ago. And our mission is to coordinate research and to develop recommendations on the use of 21st century technologies in occupational health and safety. Um, we have an email address that can be used to reach us. Um, more recently, I just have to add a couple of links for something that can be of interest. Um, we have a paper published in the Synergist, which is the journal for the American Industrial Gene Association on the challenge for Industrial Gene 4.0. And on the use of data training methodologies and real-time monitoring in occupational environments. And on the topic of today webinar, which is the transformation of health and safety real-time sensor data, we started this conversation internally at NIOSH and together with other two international partners in Europe, TNO in the Netherlands and HSC in the UK, a couple of years ago with an internal workshop. And we published the um, what we discussed at the workshop in a NIOSH blog that you can Google it and search it in, in the NIOSH blog list. Last year, in 2022, we had the first edition of public webinar on the transformation of data to information and knowledge. Um, we had the opportunity to um, listen and to discuss with three panelists from Norway, from the uh, Northern Illinois University close to Chicago in the US and from a company in Canada, Tech Resources. Um, if you didn't participate uh, to the webinar last year in July, uh, we recorded the webinar and through a little bit of um, paperwork, but we were able then to um, publish the recording of the webinar on the CDC YouTube a channel, so the link it's here on this slide and can be viewed by everyone. We are equally excited this year um, to have a new edition of the webinar and specifically <clears throat> on the topic of heat stress and strain. Um, we have three new panelists. They are gonna share their experience today with us about this as occupational hazard and the possibility of using technologies for monitoring, assessment, and control, uh, both on the heat stress and the heat strain perspective. Um, I'm particularly interested in on this topic, um, and the center is particularly interested on this topic of heat stress um, for many reasons. One, because it's common to many occupational environments, indoor, outdoor, um, as we are gonna hear today. And the second reason is because sensor technology seems to be a possible solution for the present for the future from an assessment perspective and monitoring but at the same time there are many open questions how the implementation of this technology can be possible um, to improve the the health and safety of workers um, just one note we are not going to have q a after each panelist the four of us at NIOSH, we are going to collect the Q&A information, um, and then we're going to have a round table discussion at the end, uh, where every the three panelists are going to be able to answer to the questions or to ask questions to each other as well. Thank you, everyone. 
Great. Thank you, Emmanuel. So we will get started with our first speaker, who is Spencer Pisani. Spencer is a certified industrial hygienist and the occupational health manager for PepsiCo Global EHS. His experience includes consulting for multiple sectors and corporate program design and management for manufacturing. His professional passions include clever use of real-time detection systems and expanding the way we think about worker protection. So Spencer, you can go ahead and share your slides and take it away whenever you are ready. Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, depending on where you're at. Well, thank you very much uh, for that introduction and to NIOSH for giving us the opportunity to discuss this stuff. Um, I live this all the time, and I really love talking about the challenging stuff. Uh, it's very easy to find really technical uh, stuff on this, really technical material on this topic. Uh, it's also really easy to find a very non-technical material and things that are just generic. Uh, you know, make sure to tell people to drink water type of training. Uh, what I'm hoping to do is kind of thread the needle in between and give you some stuff that's uh, that you can take away and brief both your senior most uh, leaders in your organization. Uh, take home to your family and also uh, help you communicate to your front line and your uh, your line management. So we're going to try to do all of those today. Um, the first thing and most valuable thing you might be able to do is think about how you frame your question. So when you're thinking about heat stress, heat stress, gosh, it's in the news, isn't it? Uh, there's all different sorts of things going on with the hottest temperature ever recorded and, you know, people uh, complaining about uh, the conditions that, to which they're subjected, right? This is something that's a hot topic, a hot, hot button issue right now. Um, when you're talking about using real-time detection systems, sensor technology, evaluation methods, uh, assessment, exposure assessment of any nature, the, sometimes the most important thing you can do is ask the right question. I've been on a lot of projects where no one has stopped to think about what question we're trying to ask and which question we're trying to answer. Uh, if you don't do this, you end up getting a bunch of measurements and you're not really sure what to do about it. You know, the, the inclination, of course, is, is, uh, is to measure first and think second, but really uh, you need to do it the other way. Some of the questions you might want to be looking to answer in heat stress uh, come either from the TLV framework or uh, from a more commonly uh, referenced frameworks about uh, you know, work rest rotation and heat strain. So the first one is always are job specific controls required, right? When people say, hey, I need a heat map or I need to have a heat evaluation or what's the current method to do heat stress? Uh, the first question I always ask is, what are we looking to do? What, what are we looking to make a decision based on? When you do an evaluation, it should be providing you information that you can action or choose not to action as appropriate. But uh, if you just start by uh, you know, spraying out some sort of evaluation method, you don't end up where you're looking to be at the end. So commonly, the first thing I ask is, are we looking to justify job-specific controls? Are they required here? Are we looking to require them of, us, of ourselves? The second is, is heat strain uh, more than acceptable? Right. Uh, it's very common to to get into the trap of evaluating heat strain and thinking to yourself, well, how much is this? Is this enough? Is this too much? Right. Rather, uh, or more importantly, uh, are we going to do something about it? Are we going to action the, the highest or is this something we need to action across the board? Right. Um, are work rest rotation sufficient? Boy, this is a not uh, it's a very unpopular uh, question to ask. Right. When you start talking about work rest rotations, people really get very uncomfortable uh, because that could mean production moderation. It could mean needing to change the way that you think about staffing your organization, things of that nature. So, uh, you know, when you need more people to do the same work, uh, people start to get a little bit uncomfortable. Instruments can help us answer these questions, but they can't frame them for us. Right. Uh, we need to be the people who are architecting the, the test. Think back right to seventh grade science when you were thinking to yourself, okay, I need to test, uh, I need to test something, and I need to figure out what my question is first, right? We live in a, a sea of information. And sometimes sitting there and framing the question and getting all your stakeholders to agree to what the question is and what question you want answered is the most important. I've had people who are very excited to get measurements taken and they don't understand what the results of the measurements will mean. So <clears throat> Take a moment and think of this and, and think about, uh, you know, how do we answer the question you're looking for? Common questions uh, that we covered or some that might be, you know, is this person under acceptable strain? Uh, is this area something that we, where we need intervention? 
Um, let's also talk about something very uncomfortable uh, when we're talking about uh, difficult conversations. One that, that is uh, you know, a social taboo today and something that's very important to the physics of heat is body mass. So uh, I don't know about you folks, but I am not the 154 pound reference individual. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about my uh, my personal experience here. I'm putting myself out there so that uh, that you don't need to, and that you can feel more comfortable doing so if you decide that it's appropriate for you. Uh, but this is the metabolic rate categories that uh, is used by ISO, and this is referenced inside the the ACGIH TLVs for heat stress. If you haven't read the updated heat stress TLVs, uh, I encourage you to go and actually read it. Uh, it's very common to say, oh, well, you know, I'm familiar. I've been doing this for a long time. Well, they've changed. Quite a bit, and we'll talk a little bit about what's changed. Uh, ultimately, the uh, the calculations are very similar if you've done them before, but uh, the framework is a little different. So start by thinking about what you need to assign a metabolic rate, what metabolic rate you need to assign to your work. Uh, it's really just easy to say, hey, look, you no, know, it's this is all light work. All we do is walk around and, and carry, you know, light boxes. We don't really do very much, but reality that might not actually be light work right you might be thinking of it as light work but it's actually moderate work that's a common one um you know vice versa so really think think about and document where you've identified what your metabolic rate would be i weigh 230 pounds uh and gosh i think my doctor would prefer i weigh more like 200 pounds uh, but if i'm doing moderate work the ISO estimate using that table is actually 448 watts, and you can see the math there. My body weight over the reference body weight times the 300 watt estimate at 448 watts. That's the estimate based on this table here. It doesn't mean that uh, it's necessarily the perfect number, and certainly that number will fluctuate depending on how heavy the box is, how far I have to walk, you name it. Uh, but in general, you know, it, it's kind of a wake-up call to realize that it could be so much higher than what we have as a reference uh, a reference uh, wattage that uh, we need to think about that. Uh, do you have worker specific metabolic rate estimates for your task? In my experience, I've never come across an organization that has done this from a person perspective, right? Uh, you know, Bob doing this work is 448 watts. Spencer doing this work is is uh, 300 watts. It, it doesn't really work that way, right? Uh, but you need to need to consider what question you're trying to answer while still evaluating your metabolic weight rod weight, metabolic rate and wattage. Um, let's get back to the question, right? So is control sufficient, right? Are we trying to answer, uh, you know, do, do the controls we have, are they working well enough? Do we need to do more? Can I justify more? Is this a money question? Is this an A or B question? Are we trying to answer fan or air conditioning, uh, you know, climate control? Are we looking to evaluate moving to a new building or are we looking to evaluate moving the one of the processes to an enclosure? Right. Answering that question is is uh, you know, those questions are important, but framing them is even more important because ultimately you can justify uh, in any direction. Right. You claim here's the information that that supports that. Or here's the information that refutes it. Or in my best judgment, I believe that this is appropriate or inappropriate. Uh, but ultimately, you need to frame the question appropriately. What size of control do I need? Often. Uh, very common. Do I need a little bit of climate control in just a control room, uh, in just an operator location, or do I, need, do I need to climate control an entire building? Those are big questions, right? And it, they might be different, right? If you can figure out that your process would be sufficiently controlled with just one area, climate control, where people spend a significant amount of their time as the nerve center, so to speak, that might be sufficient. It might be a much easier sell to your organization to do that. Uh, there's also a growing body of evidence, and you might have heard this. I heard this a bunch in conference this year, and I'm glad this idea is back. It was kind of growing in in popularity before COVID, and it's something that's getting a bunch of attention now, too. <laughs> Uh, that skipping to the control is ideal. You don't need, uh, somebody said, I'll, let's see if I can paraphrase, uh, you don't need to have the badge to show how bad the exposure was before you intervened. Sometimes the best thing to do is just, just go intervene, go do something. Um, welding fume is the one that I keep uh, bringing up on, on uh, you know, professional networks and things of that name, or network, that situation. The ideal amount of welding fume is none. Uh, so if you need to, to sample and take a bunch of samples and wait a bunch of time and run a bunch of labs to for, determine whether or not you've got welding fume problems, well, gosh, maybe you just should buy a fume extractor and eliminate this problem and the uncertainty around it uh, by just doing that. Investigations take time and they take money. Whether they take money indirectly or directly, I mean, it's up to you, but they always have an opportunity cost. When you're evaluating, you're not intervening. 
And sometimes that can be significant. And occasionally the change is significant enough that you do need to investigate and document and justify, but sometimes it's not the case, right? Uh, in my experience, when you uh, do jump to controls, you often save yourself a bunch of effort. Uh, in my personal experience, anecdotally, if you have to ask if you're over the TLV or someone's asking if you're over an exposure limit, you already are. The TLV feels lower than you'd think. So if you're going out to a warehouse or you're going out to a production facility or you're going out somewhere and you're saying, gosh, it's warm, you're probably already over the TLV. Uh, the ACGIH 2022 TLV guidance is the updated version for heat stress de-emphasizes the wet bulb globe temperature screening criteria you might be familiar with historically, but it emphasizes physiological monitoring. It does this by providing a calculated TLV. Now, I'm sure we've all seen the WBGT uh, uh, curve, and that curve still exists, right? The TLV itself numerically hasn't changed, but it's expressed now as this mathematical expression. And if it's, if you're like me, uh, the minute you add a logarithm to an equation, you've lost a significant amount of your non-technical audience. So be prepared to explain what a log is. No, we're not in the lumber industry. And yes, this is a mathematical expression. And yes, it needs to have the M as a variable. It's not an X. You might need to be uh, doing that sort of explanation. And that's okay, right? It's important to do that. Uh, but again, here's this metabolic rate number. So if you need to find a metabolic rate and you, your employees are not that reference body mass, it's simply a matter of physics. Uh, you need to be able to calculate that. So I've done this for myself. So here's my 400, 448 for moderate work. And again, this is just based on that ISO table and my body mass. We come out at 79.16 degrees Fahrenheit or 26.2 degrees Celsius. Please do check my math. Uh, but gosh, I wouldn't have expected that, that would be the number. And I'm imagining a lot of you listening are probably thinking to yourself, that's lower than I would think. I mean, isn't 80 okay? It's not that bad. Where workers work in 80 all the time. In fact, they work in 90 and up to 100. And again, this is not the badge of honor that your organization might think it is. It's actually a risk. And uh, most of you probably know that that risk is something you need to manage because this, if this number is lower than you think it is, it means you're at more risk than you might imagine. If you're going to use a, a wet bulb glow temperature instrument, please make sure to keep the wick for the bulb wet. This is really important. Uh, that can, unfortunately, I've had a number of experiences where the measurements for the indoor uh, and the dry bulb, the, the WBGTI, WBGTI and the, the dry bulb are the same. And I have to sit here and scratch my head and what, it's, oh, it's okay. What happened here is that someone didn't know they needed to keep that little white cube on this Quest Temp, uh, you know, filled with DI water or how on earth will I get DI water? Is that dangerous goods? Well, no, you can go to the grocery store and buy the red cap. Uh, bottled water. The one that says do not drink, uh, that one is the DI water that you can use. Some people will call this condensed steam, but gosh, use the DI water uh, to keep your instrument happy. But it's important and you need to do that uh, and make sure the folks who are reporting to you or selling work to you are aware of this as well. Uh, something else I'll mention here quickly, um, if you're going to do a wet bulb globe temperature average, it's also really useful to to factor in break time if you have an, a climate controlled break room. Something that I've done before is I have seven hours of exposure in an eight hour shift because 30 minutes of, of lunch and two 15 minute breaks are taken in the break room. So your average WBGT and your TWA WBGT might be different numbers. You should expect the TWA to be slightly less. Um, is there an easy way to measure worker body mass specific exposures and account for personal susceptibilities, uh, especially without going around with a bathroom scale? Well, there, there might be, but let's ask another question. Uh, how sure are you that all of your heart rate elevation is based on metabolic work? And you're probably thinking, what do these two things have to do with each other? Well, you could do the former, right? You could walk around with a bathroom scale and make sure that people are stepping on it, that you get body, uh, body mass uh, measurements for folks, and that you do this as kind of like a, a heat party, right, to kick off the warm, warm weather. And gosh, if you live in some parts of the U.S., it feels like that's always the warm weather. But uh, uh, if you can figure out if your heat, if your uh, heart rate elevation is all metabolic work, it's all due to exertion, then you might be in, in, in luck and being able to use some of the more evolved and advanced tools that have just come out. So if you're like me, you really like big words. Um, you like uh, like this word, and let's say it together, photoplethysmography. And yes, if it's challenging for you to pronounce, it's challenging for me too. Uh, most people will call this PPG or PPG sensors. Um, and you've got a diagram on the right about exactly how they work. Uh, this to me is magic, right? So I look at this and I get a little suspicious. Could this really be the case? 
if if 100% of your elevated heart rate comes from metabolic work, then it tracks really closely with core temperature. And, and this is where I get suspicious. Can it be that easy? Nothing we do is easy. It feels like everything we need requires a you know brief and scala correction. There's a logarithmic and uh, logarithm in the exponent, or there's something difficult that I need to explain to folks about why it's not quite the way you think it is. But uh, in reality, this this turns out to be experimentally verifiable. Instead of measuring core temperature using traditional methods or measuring atmospheric conditions of heat using a WBGTI instrument or, or O instrument if you're outdoors, uh, we can just measure heart rate. And that's a lot simpler, a lot easier. But there's a couple of things, a couple of caveats you need to be aware of. Uh, first, this is based on the principle that cardiac activity is increased for physical demand, but also as a part of your body's cooling homeostasis. More blood moves faster to help you cool. How well does it do it? Well, I mean, if you're not in great shape, uh, then maybe not that well. But if you are and you're closer to that body, well, that, that uh, reference body weight, you can see it's a pretty significant difference in total wattage. Uh, but something to keep in mind here is that validating instrument performance is up to manufacturers. Uh, some are a lot more careful than others. Some will disclose their proprietary algorithms that transform the sensor responses into an interpretation of that data. Some will not. And, uh, you know, you probably ran into this a bunch with COVID with things like thermal cameras. It's a lot harder to do thermal camera evaluation uh, to turn into to you know body temperatures and a lot less accurate than you might imagine if you don't look into exactly how the bolometry works. Um, something else to keep in mind is that folks will market things as FDA 510 cleared. That's that's a real thing, but what it doesn't mean is that the FDA is attesting that it works as described. What they're saying is that it represents uh, the, a product that's sufficiently similar to another device that's already being marketed. It's not the FDA going and testing using like a third-party laboratory architecture. It's essentially saying, yeah, this is close enough to something that's already being sold that we'll give it an okay. That's what FDA's job is, right? They're doing it well, but the challenge is that, uh, that it's not an attestation of accuracy and it's not an attestation that it's appropriate for occupational health. So on the right here, you can see one instrument uh, that was uh, did the replication study. They actually used a rectal thermometer, the gold standard, uh, which is a little gross, and certainly very difficult to use in the field, but uh, they have gone and tracked the comparison of their instrument measuring heart rate with direct rectal thermometry, and you can see it tracks very well. Uh, that break there is lunch. So you can see somebody sat down and the rectal thermometer kept going and you see the drop in core temperature, which is exactly what you'd expect as people are sitting in a nice cool break room. Everywhere else is some physical activity and you can see how quickly this changes, right? Uh, when you're looking at core temperature measurements, if you can't get to the point where you can convince your stakeholders that you can do heart rate or get the right instruments, you can do it by just uh, tempanometry, right? Sticking a thermometer in the ear. If any of you have children and have been to the, the doctor for an ear infection, you know what we're talking about. Uh, the challenge, of course, is this is logistical. You need to be able to take measurements when measurements matter, take them often enough, make sure that the uh, the the device, the ear thermometer, is uh, going to be clean enough to be able to put to someone's ear over and over again, um, you know, things of that nature. As an aside, these are easy to buy. You can grab them at any pharmacy, but uh, realistically, they might not have the level of accuracy that you expect from direct reading instrument about which you're making potentially life and death decisions. <clears throat> Biomonitoring is really a growing thing here. Um, one thing that was shown at AIHCE right front center and that I thought was really fascinating is this Paxorus device. Uh, there's a couple of these. I encourage you to look into what they're offering. Uh, but the thing that really impressed me and to tie it into the keynote uh, address really well is that the ear is a tremendous, uh, tremendous, uh, you know, almost like a USB port for information about your, your body. Um, new devices that are already in development, I was shocked to find out, uh, that will be able to use temp uh, tympanic measurements, in-ear measurements, uh, both for noise exposure, but also core temperature monitoring, and perhaps someday even volume-regulated radio or music. How much of a hero would you be at your work site if you said, yeah, go ahead, use your, your earbuds as long as they have this regulation on them, this, uh, this stick or this certification? Uh, they won't introduce uh, more, more in-ear noise than is above the integrating threshold for dosimetry. There's really no liability for you doing that. As long as it's safe for you to do so, you can go ahead and do that. I think uh, warehouse workers around the world would cheer very loud. Um, be prepared for difficult answers. If you're asking good questions, the answers can be difficult. We've already talked about some uncomfortable realities associated with body weight, but 
uh, one piece of advice I can give you is preposition how your stakeholders handle each type of result. If you're going to take a measurement, everyone in the room who's authorizing the measurement should understand what it means to be over the limit. Uh, this is the, one of the biggest lessons I've learned in my career. Sit people down and say, OK, well, if it's high, you'll need to do something about it, right? What will that be? That could be a very difficult conversation. Please also keep in mind that a per, one person's maximum save productivity may be less than another person's. This doesn't mean they have less value. It simply means that the, the reality of physics, and we're all victims of physics, uh, is that they might not be able to do as much metabolic like work before reaching a limit that could cause them to potentially have heat illness. Be especially careful of work rate metrics. They carry disciplinary action went over the TLV by temperature. Legal frameworks are still evolving. I know of at least two cases where Sorry about that. At least two cases where um, quotas and rate metrics are being evaluated by legislatures. Uh, so what you wouldn't want to do is have those two things in conflict. Think carefully about them. It could be very difficult to explain. Please, by all means, use this presentation to start that conversation. If you need to be able to lean on an expert in this field, I'm sure uh, Nash would be more than happy to support. Uh, last section, controls really matter. So NIOSH's website on heat stress control identifies increasing air movement by the use of fans and blowers as the simplest and usually the cheapest approach to increasing the rate of evaporative heat loss. Uh, they also recommend increasing air velocities and engineering control. This is what I'll call slap a fan on it. Uh, and you probably have seen this, you know, these beautiful, tremendously bladed, uh, high velocity, low speed fans, these HVLS fans, we'll talk about a bunch today. Um, they really look great attached to a roof like this, uh, but you need to be careful because while they can absolutely be amazing controls, they are not the one size fits all. Uh, HVL, uh, HVLS fans work as a heat stress control if the air that has moisture capacity to absorb sweat faster than it already does. That's what these are. They're sweat absorption accelerators, sweat evaporation accelerators. If the air can't take your sweat any faster, they're not doing much for you. We'll talk about the limitations, but before you go and slap a fan in a really warm place, think about what you're doing. If you take one thing away from this webinar today, uh, from my section, that's what I would recommend. At very high humidities, increasing air movement has a limited capacity to increase sweat evaporation rate. The air simply can't absorb any more moisture. Uh, the thing, thing, same thing is true in very dry environments where you're already in evaporating your sweat as fast as possible. I spent some time in Phoenix uh, in August a couple of years ago, and gosh, you don't feel the wetness that you do in some other more humid climates. You're already evaporating your sweat as fast as possible. Adding a fan might not actually help, because remember, sweating is the mechanism by which our body cools its skin. Fans also reduce heat stress by, uh, by pushing incident air against the skin. That's if the air is colder. If the air pushed again the, against the skin is, is, uh, is colder, sorry, if the air Air pushed against the skin is colder. The air is colder than the air is the heat sink. As a quick question, what do you call an environment where an object inside is colder than the air being forced against it? As a hint, in this case, that object inside serves as the heat sink. What do you call that? Uh, well, the word we use for that is convection oven. So if your air is hotter than your heat sink, your employee, then in reality, they're inside of, a, of an oven uh, and you're forcing heat into them as opposed to extracting it from them. Uh, if you've got the print screen button ready, this one might be one to save. Um, you really need to watch out with fans. If you have very high or very low humidity and your skin is of higher temperature, you can potentially co provide convective cooling um, it, with uh, evaporative cooling acceleration. But if the air is more is hotter at high, higher or lower humidities, then you're in danger, right? You're making it worse. Um, if the uh, the humidity is moderate and the skin is higher, you're going to get that evaporative cooling. But if the air is hotter and the humidity is moderate, you're competing. Uh, you're pushing against it. So you might not actually be making it better if the air is hotter or if your humidity is higher or lower. Now, someone once told me, if I shut off the fans, they'll riot. And that's possible, right? But you also need to be considering uh, whether or not you're actually making things better. Uh, high velocity, low speed fans also need to increase airflow against the skin to be effective. If you can't feel it, if there's no airflow, use your anemometer, uh, then it's not doing much. It's really just mixing the air in space, which could be good, but maybe not. Uh, because in some cases, in a lot of buildings, where's the hottest air in your building? Well, it's going to be right up against your roof. 
right? Uh, the sunlight is incident against a dark membrane roof, the most common type of roof in these types of things, a metal or dark membrane roof. It might be that the hottest air is way, way, way up there. And you can see in this, uh, you know, random thermal screen, uh, thermal imaging uh, image I took from Google here, it's entirely possible the hottest parts of your of your location are either where you have electricity or where you have uh, instant sunlight. Do you want your high velocity, low speed fan pulling that air down onto employees or should you leave the hot air where it is? Um, could the kind of survey you really need to do be a thermal survey, a camera survey, as opposed to one that requires a WBGT instrument? Uh, if you're going to print a screen, this one's also good too. Uh, here's my high velocity, low speed fan checklist. If you're going to use this, uh, think about each of these factors. And my general Advice is stop using fans at 95 degrees uh, Fahrenheit dry heat, 99 heat index, or 104 degrees Fahrenheit in any conditions. And people really get very upset when you tell them this. So be prepared uh, to provide some references. And by all means, I'm happy to answer questions. Um, here's an infographic that was put together uh, a few years ago that shows all of the inputs and uh, sinks and sources for heat and some of the controls that you can use. Uh, gosh, it can get a lot more complicated than this, but this is designed uh, for frontline management. So uh, please, by all means, feel free to take a screenshot of this as well. Here's another thing. I've, I've met some folks who really absolutely insist that they uh, get a temperature threshold for control. Well, again, very uncomfortable potential conversations uh, based on metabolic work rates, but here it is, right? Um, ACGH recommends that you do general controls at what might be considered to be 77 degrees Fahrenheit if you assume a bunch of stuff. As, as specified at the bottom, and 82 degrees Fahrenheit for job-specific controls if, you, if you're following those assumptions. Again, this is for acclimatized workers. So keep this in mind, but when people see these numbers, they often go, oh, I can't be right. That's too low. Maybe did you, did you carry the one, right, that kind of conversation? So uh, that's all I've got. Hopefully this has given you an opportunity to think a little differently about heat and to think about what type of sensors will really help you answer the questions that you'll be framing and I'll pass it along. Thank you. Thank you so much, Spencer. Um, before we move on to our second speaker, I will just uh, remind everyone, please um, put any questions in the Q&A box throughout this session, and we will get to them after our last speaker. So don't be shy to jot things down as they come to your mind so we can uh, look at those throughout. So while I introduce our second uh, speaker, you're welcome to share your screen, and that is Dr. Pedram Roganchi. And Dr. Roganchi is a Freeport McMurrin Endowed Professor of Mineral Engineering at the New Mexico Institute of Mining and Technology. His research interests encompass several areas of mining engineering, including occupational health, automation, subsurface ventilation, and dust control. He is also the director of the Occupational Health and Safety Lab at New Mexico Tech. This lab conducts several health and safety projects related to occupational health, the application of unmanned aerial vehicles, respirable dust, particulate toxicity, and respiratory deposition, dust suppression systems, and hazard mitigation, just to name a few. He is a co-author of over 40 peer-reviewed journal and conference presentations. I see you have your screen up, so take it away, Pedro. Awesome. Thank you very much, Emily. Good morning, everybody. Um, so when Emily told me about uh, presentation for this session, I decided to uh, I'm going to turn off my camera. I think it's easier um, to talk about some practical aspects of heat stress measurement in underground mines. It's a little bit different from other uh, industry setups. Uh, there are a lot of uncertainty associated with underground mines. Um, there is no radiation. Uh, there are a lot of equipment. And most of all, it's a very confined space at a uh, different depth. Um, just to start, I just want to mention that as we understand heat as a potential hazard all the way to when the, an accident or fatality happens due to heat, our action plans reduce based on the hierarchy of control. Um, when heat is a hazard, 
you can do a lot of engineering control and management control. But when it comes to injury and fatality, there are very little things we can do. Uh, as the previous uh, presenter mentioned, it's better to understand heat issues and heat load uh, at your workplace before something happens. And the other thing that is very important for us in mining industry is that heat is not only a health hazard, it's also a safety hazard. Um, and for most of mines, at least at this, this is a stage, um, heat is not gonna cause, it may not cause heat illnesses or other health hazards, but it's definitely gonna cause a lot of misapplication of personal protective equipment or even ability to make decisions uh, to do your task. So keep that in mind that heat is not only a health hazard, it's definitely a safety hazard. Um, and the most difficult thing is uh, we can't quantify this safety hazard related to heat because usually when we record the accident, the accident is due to mistake or due to malfunction of an equipment or, or uh, a process. Uh, in underground mines, uh, generally we have uh, three steps to control heat load. Uh, I call it heat stress and I work with temperature throughout this presentation because it's easier for us to understand, uh, but it's basically about the heat load, the uh, sigma heat in the mine. First, you have to measure it. Uh, second, you have to calculate it somehow. If you wanna be very fancy, uh, you can use very complicated thermal model, or if you are not that fancy, you can even use the temperature alone. Uh, depending on the resources, the cost, the time that you want to put in, um, you, you can calculate uh, what is the amount of exposure uh, that a miner or a worker has in an underground mine. Um, and then you act based upon it. Uh, you redesign your ventilation system, you add cooling system, or you act based on individual level, uh, provide break, etc. cetera. Um, the first thing is how we measure heat load in underground mines. Uh, we are talking about miles of tunnels. We are talking about very dynamic uh, environment. And we are talking about the environment that changes very regularly. Um, sometimes we are talking about depth of 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 feet. Um, so basically it is very important to understand why you are measuring and what is your goal. If you are measuring only to see if uh, whether the temperature is high or not, or you're planning to redesign basically your ventilation system or add a cooling system, um, keep that in mind. Again, all of these activities will cost a lot of money and a lot of time just because the, we are talking about uh, a scale of a very large uh, environment. Um, usually for us, uh, is measuring where the heat is coming from so that we can control it. Um, heat comes from machinery, heat comes from rock, uh, heat comes from poor ventilation, et cetera. And based on that, there are, there are different devices we can use. I just listed some of the, uh, uh, sensors that we are using in underground mine currently, um, majority of the mines use handheld instruments. Um, they are very handy. You can measure um, the temperature, humidity, pressure, and other psychrometric parameters right away. Um, there are continuous monitoring system, which you have to put it there for a period of time, um, measure the temperature, humidity and other psychrometric uh, parameters, take it to the lab or office, do the calculation, and it's real-time monitoring systems. Regardless of what we use, we have to understand that in our environments, our sensors is going to be affected by dust, by humidity, by da uh, damage by other equipment, um, connection, etc. Um, so I rather use a very simple device and use it correctly rather than as investing uh, a lot of money and not knowing how to use it. I just um, put a case study that 
our team have done in an underground mine um, using continuous monitoring system. Um, our goal was very simple. Our goal was to understand where the heat load is coming from, if it is steady or is, if it is dynamic, and if the mine has heat problem uh, so that we redesign the ventilation system or there is a heat problem seasonally or in specific area when we have poor ventilation. When the mine has, a, has heat as, a, as the major problem, then you have to design your ventilation system based on heat. We are talking about millions of dollars, um, but if a mine has heat issue in a specific area, that can be resolved probably with thousands of dollars. Um, the first thing is you have to understand if your equipment is generating uh, heat. And there are two ways to do that. First is if you use dispatch data, this is an example of dispatch data, very messy. The second is you go there and sit down and record all of them. Regardless of what you do, how you do the activity survey, you have to understand how much your equipment is generating. And then you have to also understand what is the temperature when there is no activity in that area, because no activity temperature also changes, like surface temperature changes, regardless of you running or sitting on a couch, the temperature outside changes. Uh, you add heat load to that, therefore it's very important to know what is the base temperature that you're working with. And again, this, these are all very dynamic. And this is an example um, uh, of a location in a mine. Uh, as you can see, re even without uh, looking at relative humidity, the temperature is relatively high. And when we add relative humidity of 70, 80, 90 percent with 33 degrees Celsius uh, temperature, that location is not safe to work or safe to be, even when there is no activity. And adding activity, you see how much the temperature is rising, but it is coming down. It comes down to the rock. It goes to the surrounding rock. It goes back to the environment. And when there is no activity, heat released back into the mine. Um, the other thing that we need to understand is that if you're doing modeling, um, your temperature at in, in environment that you are working on may be dependent or independent of the outside temperature. In this particular example, you can see the temperature on a surface is fluctuating, uh, but we get to a, to a location in a mine that the temperature won't change and stay the same, regardless of the change, drastic changes in temperature uh, on surface. And these are what the uh, a continuous monitoring can provide to you while in handheld or quick measurement cannot. Um, and then using this information, you can find out exactly what uh, the total amount of heat that is coming from a strata is coming from equipment and etc. And you can say, do the same thing from the ventilation system. Uh, ventilation system itself, although it helps to mitigate heat, it also generates heat as well, especially in mines that we have a lot of fans in underground environment, each of these fans uh, generate heat and add to the heat load. So it doesn't, it doesn't mean that ventilation system is only reducing heat. Adding more fan doesn't necessarily solve the problem. Uh, it may actually make a problem a little bit more difficult to solve because each of these fans generate heat. And the last thing, the most important thing is you have to know what is the heat load profile in your mine. Uh, this is an example of another mine that I put here. Uh, as you can see, uh, majority of heat load in a mine comes from the air going down the shaft. We call it auto compression. When the heat, uh, air goes down, it compress and, and the amount of heat load in the air increases. So knowing this profile, will help you to understand whether you can con uh, you can modify your ventilation system, you need a refrigeration system, or you don't have a heat problem, you have to look at it individually. And keep that in mind, 
when we do modeling, we are not modeling the real mind. Uh, we are not modeling the real environment. Real environment is much more messy, as you can see in these uh, pictures. Um, therefore, it is very important to regularly monitor, monitor the environment that you're working on. Even if you know the heat load, uh, even if you know the heat profile of your environment, it is important to go back and do the measurements again and calibrate your model in order to make the best decision. And then it, when it comes to all these data, we have to use um, a tool to basically calculate what's going on. A lot of mines use heat stress index, like um, wet bulb globe temperature, wet bulb temperature, all the way to very uh, uh, complicated um, models. Um, for me, the easiest way to find out if you have issue or not is asking. If you feel the environment is hot, that means that the environment is hot. Um, because individually, we respond, respond, our response to heat is completely different. Um, a person from a very hot region may feel okay, a person from coming from a cold region may feel very hot. So asking is the, uh, and recording this information is the best way to find out if there is any potential for heat stress um, in, in your environment. And when it comes to measurement and calculation, I'd rather be simple than very complicated and totally wrong, especially we are talking about an environment that is very dynamic, an environment that things change rapidly. Uh, you may have a new equipment in one place, an old equipment in another place. Uh, you are talking about activity at lo one location, no activity for several days in another location. Um, so what, what we suggest to uh, mine operations, um, you can use it as well if you're in other occup uh, occupations, is that for planning and management have two different, uh, two different approach because for heat management, day-to-day -day activity, uh, as I said, I rather do it simple. I, I rather make reasonable, reasonable uh, assumptions uh, rather than having a very complicated model a lot of different assumptions and get it totally wrong. For planning purposes, if you're planning to uh, start a new uh, active stop, if you're planning to extend your mind, or if you're planning to have a new shop, you can do a lot of things using modeling. You can do a parametric analysis. You can, um, you can do a lot of calculations, but when it comes to management of heat load in day-to-day -day activity, um, we have to make sure we are not making wrong assumptions so that basically either we delay our production or on the other hand, put other people's life in danger. And keep that in mind, there are a lot of parameters that we cannot measure. Uh, there are a lot of parameters that we can't control. Uh, a person who is coming to a mine site had a uh, party uh, the, the night before respond very differently to a person who has slept well, ready to work. A person with a, a previous history of heart disease, we respond very different um, to a person who is healthy. Um, and, and this is where heat strain is very important to know the reaction of the person to, um, uh, to heat stress. But again, if that is more, that is complicated, we rather use simple tools so that we understand the problem we have and we have engineering solution for that rather than going and making it very complicated and losing uh, interest of the management, losing the interest of the miners and participation of, that, uh, of them into um, basically resolving this hazard. Um, I try to be very fast uh, because um, I, I, I think we want to keep the time. Um, uh, please let me know if you have any questions and I'm happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pedram. 
All right, so keep the questions coming in the Q&A as they come to you. And with that, we will um, proceed to our last speaker. Dr. Margaret Morrissey Basler is an assistant professor of health sciences at Providence College and the occupational heat safety advisor at the Corey Stringer Institute. Dr. Morrissey Basler has led a 51 expert roundtable on occupational heat safety, which resulted in a heat safety consensus document with 40 recommendations to protect the health and safety of workers. She also serves as the vice chair of the Thermal Stress Working Group at the American Industrial Hygienist Association and a subcommittee member of the American Society of Safety Professionals A1050 Heat Stress Construction Voluntary Standard. She has been invited to speak about heat safety at many safety events and conferences across the country. And she has also consulted with numerous companies to improve their heat stress management plans and has dedicated her career to providing evidence-based guidelines to protect underserved working populations from heat stress through research, education, and advocacy initiatives. You can take it away, Margaret. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much for the introduction. I'm happy to be here. Niosh, thank you for the invitation. And I'm very excited to talk about the benefits and limitations of wearable sensor sensors to assess heat strain, but also heat exposure. There we go. So quick overview, what I'll be talking about today is briefly on the negative impacts of heat on worker health, safety, and productivity, use and benefits of monitoring, specifically focused on environmental and physiological monitoring, and then talking about a little bit of important considerations and limitations to using physiological monitoring. And so one thing I like to start off with is when we think about extreme heat, a lot of times we think about heat illness, right? And so it's really important to recognize that extreme heat has so many negative effects on, on that go beyond just heat illness. Of course, heat illness is a part of it, but heat can cause impaired cognition, neurological performance, then in turn can increase accidents and injuries, can increase uh, the occurrence of cardiac events, kidney injury. So these are all really important to, to recognize, um, you know, just further stating how important it is to have a heat stress management plan in place. And heat stress also has a negative impact on productivity. And so it has a negative impact on what's actually happening on the job. So this is what we call presenteeism. So examples of this would be increased time off task, like I mentioned, impaired cognitive and neurological performance, psychological distress, but it can also um, increase employee absence from work because of a heat related injury or illness. And so this is what we call absenteeism. And so both of these types of um, factors will reduce physical work capacity and then in turn can increase economic cost. And so why do we monitor? So it, I started off with talking about the negative impact of extreme heat. So we do this because we want to protect worker health, safety, and productivity. But really, we want to be able to quantify the heat exposure, heat strain. And so for the purposes of the presentation, I really bucketed these two into two different sections talking about heat exposure. And so I'm talking about environment monitoring in this context. And so that's really what the environment looks like that someone's working in. And this extends beyond just the actual air temperature relative humidity, you know, it also focuses on the clothing they're wearing. Um, and then I focus on heat strain and that's the physiological monitoring. So what's happening to the worker? How are they responding to that given environment? And so I'm gonna first talk about environmental monitoring or quantifying heat exposure. And so environmental monitoring is really measurements of uh, meteorological variables, such as air temperature, um, air speed, relative humidity, and, and radiant heat. And this is what our, our presentation uh, presenters before had mentioned as well. And I do want you to think about that environmental monitoring can be used for several different reasons, depending on, on what you can utilize in your work site. 
first and most common is utilizing it to create evidence-based work modifications. So determining what your work to rest ratios are. You can also use it to recommend additional heat stress prevention strategies and when that should be implemented. So at a given environmental threshold, this you can add this level of protection. And it also can be utilized for heat stress pepper preparation. And so this is most often utilized um, using modeling or forecasted data to be able to see what's going on in the future so that you can be best prepared. And so environmental monitoring is great because it really focuses on a group, right? So it's not telling you the individual response, which is, of course, important, which we'll talk about momentarily, but you're able to kind of address a group as a whole. And so there are so many heat stress indices out there. Um, I couldn't even name them all. And, um, but I do want to talk about two, which are very popular uh, to use within the United States. And that is wet bulb globe temperature, as we mentioned before, uh, uh, WBGT. And there's also a heat index. And so um, if, if I'm personally asked what um, I would recommend in terms of utilization of a heat stress indices, I would most often recommend wet bulb globe temperature because it's considered the indust um, industry standard. It accounts for air temperature, relative humidity, and radiant heat. And it's often utilized within activity modification, modification guidelines, such as the TLVs, as Spencer had alluded to. And so also just to add on, environmental monitoring in the occupational setting is different than what you would see in sports because it adds a different dimension. So we talked about how the environment is more than just what the, um, the air temperature or relative humidity, but it's really the clothing that that worker um, is wearing as well. So there are proposed adjustments. Um, there's also a range of metabolic rates that are utilized. And Spencer had uh, mentioned before that it is based on a reference body weight, which is important to consider. And there also is um, activity modification guidelines using WIPO globe temperature specifically um, that looks at an acclimatized versus an unacclimatized worker. And so I'm not going to get too much into the TLVs, but um, this is an example of utilizing the environment um, to then create a activity modification. But it is really important that everyone recognizes that this TLV is created based on healthy and hydrated workers and based on reference weight for the metabolic uh, estimation. And there are some industries where the proposed uh, limitations doesn't really apply to that, that specific industry. So you may have to, you can utilize the TLV, of course, but also think about other strategies that may be helpful um, in terms of providing a activity modification guideline. And so, as I mentioned previously, there's really two stages in my mind about environmental monitoring. There's heat stress preparation, so this is using forecasting or modeling data to then say, okay, uh, you know, in two days, it's gonna be the start of a heat wave. What resources do I need to make sure that I'm best prepared? Um, but when it comes to actually providing activity modifications or screening the day of work, it's really important um, in my opinion and in, in the literature has shown that um, to utilize on-site data for activity modifications. And the reason being is that um, research has shown that the comparison between on-site and forecasted data, um, it, there's not an, a true agreement between the two. So I bring up this study. It was a study done comparing the National Weather Service data, a wet bulb globe temperature to one that was measured on-site. And it's comparing all different athletic surfaces. And so uh, they found that there was an underestimate of National Weather Service data. So it was about 0.67 degrees Celsius all, all the way to about two degrees Celsius. And so there is a disagreement there. And so you may be saying, okay, that's not too much difference, but it could be the difference that could result in a wrong work rest modification recommendation. So um, with that, really think about ways that you can utilize 
um, environmental monitoring on site when you're actually providing those activity modifications. And so I, now I want to touch on um, physiological monitoring. And so I first want to talk about the purpose of using it. And I think there, there's a lot more than this, but these are the four that really um, I'm focused on today is so first there's risk assessment. So essentially, am I you know, susceptible to, uh, to uh, exertional heat illness? Um, you can use it for decision making. So this would be activity modification when, um, when to stop work. It can also be utilized for the assessment of interventions. So someone is responding a certain way after you implement, I'll give an example of just a hydration or body cooling uh, intervention um, to kind of to assess whether or not it's changing physiology. But there's also another important thing that I think people often forget is that in the context of heat strain, you can utilize physiological monitoring for health promotion and education. So if you know someone's wearing a wearable watch, they can look and they can see their own data. And if they can kind of respond and hopefully be, uh, their behavior will change based on what they're seeing. So if their heart rate is really high, that will cue them to say, okay, perhaps I should take a break. So it's not always just determining a threshold uh, for safety, but rather can be used in that context as well. And so one thing I really want to talk about is, is risk assessment when we're talking or utilizing physiological monitoring devices. And so this is where we need to be a little bit careful in terms of determining whether someone um, is about to have a, a, a exertional heat illness um, or is close to. And this question I get asked all the time is, can, is physiological monitoring uh, protecting against heat related injuries and illnesses? And so um, what I'll say is we, we really don't know, and I hope someday we'll be able to have this accurate device that can tell you exactly what someone's core temperature is, but we really don't know. And a lot of the times it's because core temperature response among um, workers is very individual. So the detection of a near miss of having a, an exertional heat illness is very difficult to determine. And so an example would be, you could have someone who's at 103.5 degrees Fahrenheit and be completely fine. Whereas you could have someone at 102.5 and they could be struggling and um, you know, not working to the, their usual capacity. And one thing I also like to mention as well, which further complicates everything is that exertional heat illnesses don't follow a continuum. So um, you don't have these heat cramps, and I, I put them in quotations for a reason because it's actually the correct ter terminology is exercise-induced muscle cramps. Um, so it doesn't start when these cramps going to syncope, so fainting, to heat exhaustion, heat stroke. You can get any of these symptoms at any time, and that why and the reason why um, it's important to consider is you shouldn't you know, utilize that thought process of the continuum to then diagnose any heat illness. And so going, you know, thinking about physiological monitoring, what do we measure? Um, there are so many things to measure, um, especially with the advancements of technology, there's heart rate, there's oxygen saturation, um, caloric expenditure. But for today, I'm going to talk about core temperature um, because often when people are looking for uh, metrics or you know devices, they're looking at the metric of core temperature because we know that core temperature is utilized to diagnose a, a heat exhaustion or heat stroke. And so there's a lot of things that you need to consider when you're utilizing core temperature specifically. Um, in the context of uh, trying to assess risk or, you know, making safety decisions. And there are a lot of different ways to assess core temperature. There's the direct method. Um, and I'm thinking about this in the lens of a field setting. So this would be the gastrointestinal pills, of course, esophageal and rectal thermometry are considered gold standards, but very un un unlikely to occur in the field. Um, there's assessments of indirect measurements. Um, so this would be, you know, assessing oral, oral with A-U-R-A-L in the ear, tympanic, temporal, 
Um, and um, I am not a huge fan of these because it doesn't show you any really good response. And they've shown to be very, very inaccurate. And I'll, and I'll touch on that in the next slide. Um, and now there's these estimated measures. So it's these wearable devices that use algorithms to then predict what core temperature is. And again, we utilize these assessments to make safe decisions, but we don't can't really use them to diagnose anything. So an exertional heat, whether something is a heat exhaustion or heat stroke. So um, we have found across the literature that um, core temperature assessment using the, what, I, what I had termed indirect measures are very inaccurate. And so we did a study, um, we go to the Falmouth Road, and I'm talking about the Corey Stringer Institute, we'll go to the Falmouth Road Race every year, which is a race in Massachusetts where it's in August, it's very hot, seven miles, and there's a lot of heat strokes. And so um, we'll get to do a lot of research investigations on individuals who have suffered a heat stroke or may have uh, had a potential heat stroke. And so what we did is while they're being assessed um, for rectal, using rectal thermometry to actually diagnose um, what they had, we also measured, um, I'll just call it ear thermometry for now, ear, ear thermometry to, to look at the comparison between the two. And we found that in these heat stroke patients, it was about 4.3 degrees Fahrenheit difference, which is a uh, considerable amount, and even in the ones that weren't diagnosed as, as heat stroke, we also saw about a two degrees Fahrenheit difference. Um, so again, I would be uh, really careful in utilizing uh, those particular devices at this time um, and um, pay attention to some of the validity, which studies in the future, which I'll mention um, next. So uh, actually, before I do that, I want to talk about um, just quickly the estimated core temperature. So the wearable sensors. So it essentially will utilize other metrics other than core temperature to estimate core temperature. And so um, a lot of times um, if someone tells me about a new device and it, they say it measures core temperature and it's not, you know, one of the, the gold standard assessments, I'll say, okay, it doesn't really measure core temperature. How does it estimate core temperature? This is a really important um, consideration. And so some of the metrics that are often utilized to be able to estimate core temperature are heat flux, skin temperature, heart rate, activities. They'll utilize environmental metrics. Um, some devices will implement some individual characteristics. And um, now we can also use machine learning to then predict estimated core temperature. So we're in a really exciting time of being able to see the technology evolve. Um, but there are a lot, again, a lot of considerations um, to have when this, this develops. And so some of the considerations um, I wanted to bring up is, or you should really be thinking of yourself when you're, when you're looking for a device that's gonna uh, um, estimate core temperature or you wanna to use to assess heat strain is you really should know what's the purpose, right? So why are you using it? Talk, think about those four things that I had previously mentioned. Um, do you know how to interpret it? A lot of times I'll work with companies, they'll collect the data and they'll say, oh, we have this data, uh, we don't know what to do with it. And so that's a problem, right? You definitely need someone who's able to interpret it and you can determine how to utilize it. It needs to be team-based. Uh, needs to measure what it's intended to measure, depending on the context in which you're going to use it. And then um, is the device validated or the metric within the device validated you know, or is it reviewed by an external third party? I personally, when I'm looking at different uh, devices, I look for that external third party validation because I think it really removes a lot of the bias. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean it it, it's not as powerful if, some, if you know, a manufacturer validates it, but you need to be able to see the step-by-step -step process at which it was validated. And validation is so important because there's a lot of inaccuracy of data that's caused by sweat, heat, activity. Um, so you can see on the right side, the average accuracy from someone who's resting to activity can decrease by 30%. So a lot of things can change. And so um, I want to, there's one study, and this is 
absolutely not saying the study is is not a good one. I um, it is a very good study, but I want you to think about the context at which this study is validated. So this is a validation study with a wearable device and ingestible pill. And so when we think about the context, we this is just an example of, of in this particular study what the participants were. So it was in nurses, it was about the environmental conditions were 71 to 85, 40% relative humidity, and they were asked to do cognitive tasks and nursing skills in a simulation. So when I'm trying to think about a, you know, metric within a device and whether or not I feel that it's strongly validated in the occupational industrial setting, I'll ask myself, okay, are the participants reflective of a laboring or physical um, individuals who perform physical activity population? What were the conditions? Were they hot? Where did the study take place? And are those tasks really reflective of what workers would be asked to do? And also another thing I look for is how um, hot do they get, right? So we can see that in this particular study, they got to about 101.1 degrees Fahrenheit. And the problem with that is that they didn't really reach that what we call hyperthermic threshold. So someone isn't really considered to be hot if they're not until they're over 101.3. And so um, we've also noticed or, or found that as someone's core temperature goes up, so if you're looking at rectal thermometry, the agreement between the metric that's estimated and the gold standard tends to fall apart or be a lot different. So we really need to be able to see whether or not that data is accurate when someone's at higher core temperature thresholds. And so I'm just for sake of time, I'm just gonna quickly go to this part. And this is just another example. Um, it's using the, the actual study that I was a part of um, just to really show again, their context matters. So we essentially did a study where it was eight hours uh, in a lab, men and women, they were in hot, humid conditions and um, dry hot conditions. We got their temperatures really high. So it was about 39 degrees Celsius. They wore um, battle dress uniforms versus a t-shirt and shorts. So we had all of these great things that we were able to utilize, but the participants were really young. It was 18 to 25. It was done in the lab. So there's a lot of great um, data that we're able to pull from this. But again, we need to think about, okay, the participants were young, it was in a lab, um, it was on a treadmill um, exercise. So it's important to remember this context. And so um, I think this is my last slide, but I just, again, I really highly um, um, highlight the right sensors use the right way approach. And I think it's um, looking at heat strain is not, um, it's, it's good to look at that evaluation through this lens. And one thing I just really wanna, uh, point out is that when we think about these data rules and responsibilities, when we talk about heat strain, the most often thing that's forgotten is the utilization of those sensor and data analysts. So a lot of the times we have um, companies themselves trying to be able to interpret the data and they really have no background of physiology or human response to heat. And I'm not saying you have to be, you know, a thermal physiologist and, and trained PhD, but it's really important to identify who's that role and to utilize someone who's who's able to help uh, interpret and analyze that data that's collected. So this is just a quick summary of um, pros and cons, and this is so this is for in uh, focused on physiological monitoring specifically. So it's great that we can assess the individual. We get immediate data, can use it to make safety and health decisions. And the great thing is that we're continuously evolving in health technology and machine learning. We're getting better and better each day. Some of the cons are really, I won't say cons, but considerations is really um, validity in real life scenarios is limited. We're still growing. There may be some barriers to user buy-in. Near miss um, is difficult in the context of thinking about exertional heat illness. Um, and there really isn't any thresholds or there, there, we're starting to see some, but not um, 
universal thresholds for safety decision utilizing physiological monitoring for, for heat strain. So just wanted to leave you with that. And um, my contact information, um, I am a professor at Providence College, but I work at the Corey Stringer Institute as well. So feel free to um, shoot me an email if you have any other questions. Thank you so much, Margaret, and thank you to all three of our speakers. Fantastic job. And uh, with that, I'll turn it back over to Emmanuel to navigate some Q&A, and uh, we will get some questions answered for everyone. Thank you, Emily, and thank you to uh, everyone, uh, Spencer, Pedram, and Margaret. Um, it was fantastic. I was taking some notes. It was incredible how you touch a different perspective from environmental monitoring and engineering side, physiological monitoring, um, and all aspect in between. So I, it, it was really fascinating to hear all these and how in between data, data that are coming from sensor play a role. So we have a number of questions in the Q&A um, and I, um, I'm gonna go and ask them for you. We have around 30 minutes 15 minutes, maybe max, if you want to go over a couple of minutes. So I just encourage you, just get to the point and then we can see if there are other questions coming in or question from you all as well for each other. So the first question is for Spencer about possible suggested ranges of humidity for fans. So like, what is your idea in terms of low, moderate and high humidity for when using fans for control or not? Yeah, I don't have a, a specific number, and I think it would depend on a number of other factors like total amount of air movement and things of that nature. Um, what I want folks to take away from that is that if you are in extremely dry environments, right, uh, in the the very low, the Arizona, Nevada type, uh, but Calgary, I learned recently has got a very low humidity um, if you're in those very dry environments and you know it's dry right you're you're in in the desert there are cacti or whatever grows in calgary personally never been there but i'd like to go um, you should be thinking hey this might not actually do a whole lot for me um, same situation if you're living near you know the swampy type very humid humid areas um, if you see that you're sweating and you're soaked in sweat and your workers are soaked in sweat, regardless of how much air movement you have, that might also not be doing it. So I don't have specific numbers. I'd love to find that out, uh, but it's something that folks don't often think about, the mechanism that's actually occurring to provide the cooling and whether or not fans are making it better, right? Mm -hmm. So before you go and spend 50 grand on a, a giant HVLS fans, at least think about where you're at. Thank you, Spencer. Um, I'm going to move to a question that I have for Pedro, which is related to these. So Pedro, you talk a lot about um, monitoring for heat load. Um, so in, in a complex environment like an underground mine, but if I need to be honest, most likely there are other similar environments that are as complex that might benefit from, from that type of mindset and idea from an engineering perspective. What is, in your opinion, what is missing? Uh, is it missing better instruments, more instruments to collect those data, or maybe the connection between the data from the instrument and the models? Um, and I'm thinking this because it's related a little bit with the fans that uh, um, Spencer just touched upon now. Like, what what is the next step, or is everything is already perfect? And uh, um, thank you for the question. No, nothing is perfect. I think the main thing that is missing is use of sensors accurately and making sure that the sensors that are placed in the in the, in the working areas are well calibrated well maintained and being used uh, accurately um, in underground mines specifically uh, because basically it's a very large environment in a in a confined uh, way um, and it's very dusty. It's a lot of gases and other thing involved. Uh, making sure the sensors are working is 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 very critical. And the the second thing is education. Uh, if the mines and at the engineer level or management level understand the necessity of measurement and making sure everything is up to date. Um, and uh, as I said, simple is better 
uh, in my opinion, because it's going to cost less, it's going to be less complicated, and it's going to be more attractive to management. Thank you, Pedro. Um, I have a question for probably all of you, um, but most likely would be Margaret and Spencer in the Q&A. was about, I think, already see some PPE adjustment um, when we're in a cool invest and the, for example chemical protected clothing and um, I mean what's up of negative adjustment how much um, who of you I don't know if my, Margaret or Spencer wants to answer yeah so um, I is to my knowledge there really isn't any research to suggest what that adjustment would be um, we're not I haven't seen any of the cooling uh, devices be implemented into adjustments. Um, Spencer, I don't know if you agree, but that's my understanding. Yeah, I do agree. Um, I would be very cautious in deviating from the printed TLV guidance in this regard. Um, in the event, you know, again, prepare for the worst. If in the event that you were to find that uh, your cooling vest was insufficient and an employee had heat stroke, permanent brain damage, you know, that kind of situation, the last thing you'd want to do is explain to opposing counsel or your organization's legal team, why you felt it was appropriate to apply your own derived negative adjustment factor. I mean, uh, in my experience, ice vests are of minimal assistance. Um, if you're yeah. talking about a, if you're talking about like a fully encapsulated suit, you're doing something NASA level, by all means, you need to, to take a deeper look. But I remember reading a story recently about uh, the last person to enter the giant crystal cave uh, that it's down, I believe it's in, in the you know Central America somewhere. I want to say Mexico, but I'm not super sure. The giant, these giant, big, beautiful crystals, and it's like 130 degrees. So they had to wear ice vests. But even then, with the people who are totally prepared to do this, they can only last 15 or 20 minutes, right? So the ice vests are well, maybe they help a little bit, but in my experience, they're a bunch of hassle. They get people wet. They're they're messy. They're difficult to keep hygienic. I would definitely not apply a negative. Uh, negative clothing adjustment factor for that. Got him. And about something very specific and technical, about, I think Spencer, you were talking about keeping wet the wet bulb, um, but there are some units that are doing it electronically, the measurement. So do you guys have any experience about how accurate and reliable can be that electronic wet bulb measurement? I don't. And uh, thank you, Dr. Mills, for, for the question. Uh, I'd love to see some uh, some research done on how accurate those are and whether we could trust them or not. Um, personally, I have some concerns about anyone claiming that they can replicate a physical, uh, uh, you know, a physical phenomenon like evaporation, right? That, that wick is a known uh, a known surface area and has a known evaporation rate. And gosh, uh, I wouldn't trust that. That being said, I could be convinced, right? If an uh, organization like uh, 3M or TSI came out and said, hey, we've got a, a verifiable method and here it is, I would be absolutely be reading that. Sure. Yeah, I would uh, have to just add on, like in agreement with Spencer is that um, I'm I'm always willing to, to hear or see what, what you know, is out there, but I, I have to see the data and evidence that's able to suggest um, that accuracy. So uh, never say never, but I need, we need to see the data first. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Um, and I think a uh, last question that I was in the q &A, it could be an answer for another couple of hours. So I uh, think it <laughs> what is possible because it's like, how well is our trade monitors correlate to its stress? I think it's a very big question. It is. So I'll take the first uh, first blush here. Yeah, all of you, uh, for sure. We need answer. additional uh, opinion. Hey, uh, I seem to remember that someone wrote a Synergist article on evaluating heat stress monitors. Uh, do <laughs> anybody remember that? So the three... Uh, at least the three of us here have contributed to that article. Really good technical rundown on whether or not you can trust that and what you should trust and what you should verify. Um, from a high level perspective, how I, I think the question that should, uh, let, let me break into two pieces. How well is, is heart rate correlated with heat stress? If you're assuming that all of your heart rate increase is due to heat stress, you can make that assumption in a lot of cases, but not in all. Right. If you have anything that increases heart rate or if there's a medication factor or if there's a like my, my mother has tachycardia. Right. That would not be an appropriate uh, assumption to make. But if you can't reject the hypothesis that all of your exertion and uh, all of your heat 
heart rate elevation is from exertion, then yeah, I could say it's probably pretty well correlated. But how well does each instrument evaluate it is an instrument by instrument question, which is why you should expect instrument manufacturers to provide some level of verification. Uh, and it should be within the range uh, you know, something Dr. Uh, Dr. Morrissey mentioned uh, when we were writing that article is it has to be within the range that you're challenging at, right? You can't extend the graph in either direction, and you know, in either direction infinitely. You can say, hey, look, this has been validated. It's been validated under these conditions. Will it work going into a crystal mine? Pro probably not, right? Uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't trust it quite that far. I think all things diverge, but uh, you should be looking for for the manufacturer to prove it. Right, or at least put up something that you can turn around and say, this is what I based my systematic evaluation on. Sure. Yeah, Margaret, just to, uh, Pedro, yeah, just to add to that, I think, um, I mean, that question is, is a lot to unpack, but I also think um, if you're thinking about the utilization of heart rate monitoring to be able to then make some sort of safety decisions, what's the purpose of wanting to know the agreement between the two? Um, it's that's an important you know consideration because um, for example, if you're using heart rate monitors, are you picking a certain threshold at which you'll make you know the certain decision? So I think there's a lot more questions than whether or not are they correlated or not, but rather can you utilize this particular metric or or excuse me device that estimating our heart rate or, or actually measuring it to then make some sort of decision um so that's it's a lot more than um you know just thinking about the correlation i would say sure uh pedram do you have any no I agree. I'm, or anything I'm, on the... I'm an engineer by education but i can only imagine like first of all how accurate that measurement is you know workers chew tobacco that increase the heart rate workers jump up and down that increase um you know they they sweat that measurement device any variable measurement device uh can have inaccurate data so uh, but it's definitely one of the uh, one of the factors if there is a very complicated uh heat strain model the heart rate can be one of the factors and uh, you know a lot of people by nature they have high heart rates you know age and everything there are more uncertainty than relying on heart rate uh, although it's easy very cheap to measure right now with the smartwatch at the same time can be very inaccurate indicator but I'm not a doctor I'm <laughs> just say my opinion I think also just to add is that um it also depends on which the purpose at which you're using it. So um, yes, we want to think about everything is in total agreement. And I, I know that this, you know, is accurate and validated, but if you're using it for certain things, like I had mentioned, like trying to cha change behavior, does it matter if it's perfectly aligned as long as its only purpose is using to get them to cue in with their own body's response? Maybe not. Um, but if you're thinking about it, um, you know, from a risk or you're thinking about it from a safety decision perspective, then yeah, like it is important to think about, you know, that the differences that it has in potential correlation. Thank you. Um, and, and I need to be honest, that's why I think it's stress and strain from a data and sensor perspective is so interesting because it can go from the engineering side of construct and managing a workplace all the way to the response of the workers to risk uh, to behavior training or education it it encompassed the entire span um it was interesting to hear also your answer your comments coming from different perspective in the way i see it um in the east coast in the us it's 11 30 uh so we are right at the end of our time as a webinar um and i like to thank uh, Margaret Spencer and Pedro um, again uh, for the ability and for the for the time spent with us today in discussing this aspect. Um, I will encourage everyone online still. If you have questions or requests, please send an email to the e email address sensors at cdc.gov, and we're going to try to answer. There was a question about uh, credits for continued education. I think we can probably come up with something from that perspective as well. Um, with this said, um, thank you very much for participating to this and um, being connected um, on this important topic, and we hope 
to come up with more webinars in the future and, and events from the Center for Direct Reading and Sensor Technologies. Thank you very much, all. Thank you, everyone. Bye.